right, this morning we're picking back up in the book of Revelation and looking at an overview of it. We are going to kind of focus on the seven trumpets. This would be Revelation chapter 7, uh, starting in verse 1, and we'll go through chapter 9, verse 21, which is basically the, the chapters there. Now, prior to this, we were looking at the timeline of the church on earth. It has, uh, of course, been completed at the time by the time we get to chapter seven. So this was in chapter one through three, where it's giving us a, a very good description of the seven different periods of the church that's here on earth. And from that, we know that we are in the last period. We are in the the uh, the period that's described as from the Laodicean church, where we have assemblies that are very wealthy but they're not interested in doctrine at all. You know, they'll use Jesus' name, but that's it. So they have, that is the church in chapters one through three is kind of described. And then the church is in heaven in chapter four. And this is where we see the 24 elders in the church beginning to serve in a priestly manner to God. And then we also looked at the timeline of events before the tribulation begins. And this, uh, you know, really does to some degree start in chapter five. There's a little bit of overlap in chapter four because we actually have the uh, church um, serving as priests at that point. But there's primarily a lot of things that have to happen before the tribulation begins. And it is not um, anything that relates to the church actually being snatched from the earth that it well the, the church being snatched from the earth allows then the timeline that was paused because of the dispensation of grace to continue so it's going to pick up likely as i've said within a few months we're going to see quite a change in the world very quickly and rapidly the rise of the ten nations we do not have the ten nations today scripture is very clear when they rise they rise for an hour so we do not know who these kings are at this point. Um, that doesn't mean we don't have nations. We just don't know who the kings are at this point. And they will rise as a uh, ten-nation confederacy to revive the Roman Empire at this point. So, of course, from that, we kind of get a general idea of who it's going to be in the area, you know, but nothing today indicates that it's the rise of the 10 nations. Um, there's nothing that's happening today. And then, of course, the man of lawlessness, he's not revealed until after the church leaves. So we of the church will never know who the man of lawlessness is. We'll never see him. We'll never be able to detect him. He rises afterwards. Then we're looking at the scroll with the seven seals. This begins the tribulation period. At the very beginning of the tribulation period, we have peace on earth. Now, that is instituted by the man of lawlessness with a seven-year contract that he is going to sign with Israel, which is going to bring peace to the land of Israel to a degree that Israel will take down its walls. Okay, so it's not, uh, it's not fictitious in the sense that he's just signing a contract and saying we won't do anything. He is actually going to protect Israel. And then the next uh, horse is talking about another condition coming upon the earth where peace now turns to war. Israel still protected as we were just uh, looking at that. But the man of lawlessness, of course, is going to destroy anybody who tries to come up against Israel. But men are going to start fighting again and other nations are going to start fighting Third seal, we see economic woes and starvation, and this comes from famine and disease and other things like that. And then the fourth uh, seal, there was great death that comes upon the earth, and we have death in Hades following it. So it is a pretty clear description that it is the unbelievers, and there's going to be a lot of them that die. So much death that death will cause death. You know, and, and that that does actually happen. You you can't be exposed to death without, I mean, you got to be very cautious when being exposed to it. Then we have the fifth seal, which had to do with the martyrs in the tribulation period. Um, now that kind of, it, it does jump all the way forward, really to mid-tribulation period, where it's kind of primarily focusing at this point, 
we are going to have more that join them because you do actually see as they're as they're crying out to God, when is our justice? He says, be patient. There's more of you coming. And there are going to be more in the second half of the tribulation period that are going to come. And then the sixth deal is the war of Gog and Magog with the man of lawlessness. And this is mid-tribulation period at this point. Uh, we have a massive uh, nuclear war. And the way it describes it in scripture is very clear that it's nuclear. Now, it's it's interesting how John describes some of this stuff. But for an earthquake to impact the air, for the air to, to roll, to kind of roll up like a scroll, all of these things that he's describing, we know now are actually from nuclear weapons and how they have, how they, uh, how they function. Even, of course, the uh, great hailstones falling is an impact or a result of that. Now we come to the ceiling of the 144,000. And this is in Revelation chapter uh, 7, verses 1 through 17. Now, in the timeline, it is still staying consistent with the timeline, although we're going to jump a little bit out of the timeline in the context here because he's going to describe, he's going to kind of go on beyond the ceiling of the 144,000 to describe the result of their ministry. But at first, we're right here at mid-tribulation period where 144,000 Jews are going to be sealed. It is very clear from Scripture, and for those who try to claim that they're part of the 144,000, they are not because Scripture is very clear. It happens at mid-tribulation period, and it is from the tribes of Israel and males. That's all there is to it. I mean, Scripture is very clear on that. The wind upon the earth is stopped at this point. This is mid-tribulation. So the wind is actually going to be stopped upon the earth. And just prior to this, of course, is when, or right at this time, I should say, prior to the wind being stopped, the 144,000 are going to be sealed. So in Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, And after these things I discerned four angels standing upon the four corners of the earth, while holding the four winds of the earth in order that the wind should not blow upon the earth, neither upon the sea, neither upon any tree. Now, at this point, like I said, 144,000 Jewish men are sealed for the ministry of the kingdom of the heavens. And going through that, we have every tribe except for one of them, which would be Dan. That specifically uh, relates to uh, Dan being one who first brought in idolatry, and he's not included in this. And I heard the number of the sealed 144,000 having been sealed out from every tribe of sons of Israel. Again, it's very specific in scripture. So I know that there's uh, groups of people today who want to say that there are the 144,000. But if you keep scripture in context, that's just not possible, especially because they're Gentiles who are saying that. Gentiles and uh, some females, which again contradicts what scripture says. You know, and this is just going off of what Scripture states. Now we then have the slain saints. Now they are slain by the harlot, the false prophet, and the idol of the man of lawlessness. Because prior to mid-tribulation period, the saints were being slain by the harlot. But now we actually have the false prophet who's rising, who's giving rise, of course, evidence to the fact that the man of lawlessness is God, or at least, you know, he's for persuading people that he's God. Because remember, that's what the man of lawlessness is going to do at this point. He's going to set himself up in the temple as though he is God. Then we have the false prophet who's doing signs to say, yeah, what he says is true. Okay, but we also have the harlot at this point, too. So they're going to be dealing with this. And then, of course, the uh, the false prophet sets up an idol to the man of lawlessness. And the idol has people put to death who refuse to actually worship it. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. And I said to him, my Lord, you intuitively know. And he said to me, these are the ones having come out from the great tribulation and having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Of course, like I said, in the context there, he's talking about these that are slain and describing them. And he's saying, who are these? 
you know, now um, in the context here, by the way, my Lord is actually, uh, I did put it in lowercase, and I think most of our translations do, because he's referring to um, actually one of the elders. So he's not referring to the Lord at this point. Now we have the seven, uh, the seventh seal, which is going to begin, or the seventh seal happens, and then we have the beginning of the seven trumpets. And this is in Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. And when he opened the seventh seal, there came to be silence in the heaven as far as an as half an hour. And I discerned the seven angels, the one standing before the throne, and it was given to them seven trumpets. So we now have the seals that are finished at this point, and then seven trumpets are going to be coming right after them. Now, the word silence here, as we were looking at, is actually only used a couple of times in Scripture. And it is a word that does actually mean nobody is speaking at this point. It is not a deafening silence in heaven. There's a lot of activity going on in heaven, and it's a very noisy place just in general. Uh, we see that in a lot of different ways it is described. But we suddenly see nobody is actually speaking. Now, we also know some of the other things that are going on at this time is we have a war in heaven where uh, Michael and his angels kick out Satan and his angels. So that's happening right about this time here where we have that. And then we have this sudden silence. Now, over in Acts chapter 21 and verse 40 is where we get an example of the fact that, you know, it's, it's a hush. There's a great silence. Now, this is Paul standing on the steps in the city, motioning to the people that had just tried to kill him, and they all became quiet. But obviously, the sounds of the city are still going on around them. It's the people that actually um, stopped talking. They were being, they were hushed. It um, uses a different word for silence, which does not mean uh, to be tr tranquil or still, but indicates, like I said, a silence in speech. Uh, First Thessalonians or First Timothy two eleven through twelve talks about a kind of a silence that means to be uh, tranquil or still. Like I said, it's not really describing in heaven all of a sudden everybody stops, but it does describe everybody suddenly paying attention to what's going on and nobody's speaking. That's kind of more of the description here. So, uh, First Peter two eleven and twelve, as we were going through there, let a woman learn quietly with all submission, and do not permit a woman to teach, or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she should remain quiet. That is not a word that means she is not to speak. It means she is to be of a, a really within her mind, still quiet in that sense, tranquil, content with the position that she has and not one who tries to usurp authority. Peter also uses a different word for this. So there's like three different Greek words that talk about how you actually silence something. We have one that's uh, Revelation here is specifically talking about everybody stops talking. Over in Timothy, we have one that's just being quiet, still, tranquil. And then we have putting a muzzle on it. <laughs> so now this isn't a muzzle term. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 15 talks about this. For this is the will of God that you, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Now translate that correctly, and it says you should put a muzzle on them by doing good. Now it's not by your words, it's by your actions. Mm -hmm. Because they're the ones who are going to speak bad things about you because they don't like the fact that you're not getting involved with their, their wickedness, <laughs> their wrongdoing. So we have this great silence in heaven, and now we have the start of the great tribulation period. Satan has been cast out of heaven. The seals are done, and now we're going to go into the trumpets. So the scroll with the seven seals is uh, then flipped over. Because remember, at the beginning, it was describing it as a scroll written on both sides. Well, you can't read the other side until you've completely um, unraveled the first one. You have to, and all the seven seals had to be actually broken in order to get to where it's full length and now it's getting flipped over. And there's a whole lot of more information on the other side of it at this point. 
uh, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. It was written on both sides. I discerned upon the right hand of the one sitting upon the throne, a scroll written on the inside and outside, having been sealed with seven seals. The man of lawlessness and the harlot have reigned for three and a half years at this point, because we're coming into mid-tribulation. Uh, many have been slain by the harlot for religious purposes. So remember, as it's describing how they are slain, it uses a word that means to be slain as a sacrifice. So those who are being killed at this time are being killed for a religious reason. You know, they will call them heretics or other, you know, they, they blasphemy or something like that. It's going to relate to religious things. We know of the three daughters of the harlot right now. So the harlot's going to rise. She's been, uh, at, at this point in, in the book of Revelation, she's been reigning for three and a half years. The harlot does not reign today. And we don't know the ultimate, when she manifests herself for what she is, we as a church don't know that at this point. But we can actually see some of her daughters. Okay, because remember, it's referred to as mystery Babylon, which means it hasn't been fully revealed yet exactly what she is. We have details. We know she's a religious system. We know she is the one who's going to bring the man of lawlessness in. Or at least she's going to look like she's in control of the man of lawlessness for a while. You know, and she's going to basically reign over all the religions on the earth. So it isn't something that we have today. That's not to say that we don't have some entities that are attempting that today, because we certainly do have some world church and a few others that are trying to bring that concept in. So covenant, uh, of course, um, well, Catholicism and Reformed Covenant are pretty obvious. And I do actually combine those two together, Reformed and Covenant, because technically they are. Um, and then progressive is what you see today in relation to the churches that are very liberal. They, they'll describe themselves as very liberal. It is the Laodicean church. You know, we have to accept um, perversity within our assembly in order to be progressive in the way that we're presenting the gospel. And that perversity is not just... Um, restricted to one particular group it's actually presented in a lot of different areas you know, where you have pastors that are more interested in money and honestly in in many cases are thieves and they're never they're never removed from their position when they're known to be so and they're known to be liars but yet people don't take the proper action oh because we have to be loving but that's not actually loving. That's loving in relation to the world. Loving in relation to uh, the Christian love seeks the best for the one love. So it's not going to allow somebody to continue sinning. You know, not to mention the sexual perversity and other things that are being permitted within the church. So, so that's where that progressive theology comes in. She reigns from Rome. So she's not going to be in the... Jerusalem at this point, she will reign from Rome, from the city of Rome. Uh, we do the, that from scripture. And it again, it goes back to the fact, and now I have heard a lot of people try to, to pinpoint Babylon in different areas of the globe, saying, well, there's seven hills in this area, and there's seven hills in that area. As a matter of fact, I think you could almost pinpoint it to the majority of cities. Seattle, Portland, um, I think Moscow. I don't know if there's, but I mean, remember a mountain is relative to where you're at. You know, some mountains are bigger than others, you know, but the reality is the only one historically known at the time of this writing as the one on seven hills is actually the city of Rome. So she is going to reside there. The man of lawlessness has been killed and brought back to life. And we were looking at details about that. A demon is going to be released from the abyss that is going to bring the man of lawlessness, soul and spirit, back into his uh, physical body here on earth. 
and is going to animate his body so that it continues to live because, of course, it's technically dead. But he's going to be able to animate this body in a way where it continues to uh, to thrive until he's ultimately thrown into the lake of fire along with the, the man of lawlessness and everybody else. Israel escapes out into the wilderness by the the man of lawlessness, um, and God will protect her there. So she's going to escape because the man of lawlessness is going to suddenly turn on Israel. At three and a half years, it's not going to be, oh, things are kind of souring. We should like for maybe prepare to run. Oh, no, no, no. You're going to wake up one morning and things are going to be bad. They're going to be destroying um Jews in the streets and everything else. And they are, because the way it describes it, they are to run immediately. You know, and they will, quite a few of them will escape. God will permit it. And they will uh, be protected in the wilderness. We know exactly where that position, that place is that they're going to be protected at. Um, it's not going to be anything that we as Gentiles can do about it because God's the one who's going to protect and provide for them. Satan does just attempt to destroy them, but God doesn't actually permit it because he he uh, tries to send a flood to destroy them. And God has the earth open up his mouth and swallow up the water that's there. Now, Satan, of course, he's not a stupid being. He's fully aware if God's going to do that, that means he cannot touch these people. And he, he sends his attention other where, other places really to the Jews who aren't out in the wilderness. And primarily those Jews that are not out in the wilderness, where are they? 144,000 that are spread all over the globe at this point, uh, spreading the gospel. Now God is going to begin to deal with the Gentiles specifically. Now, prior to this, God was dealing with uh, Israel. And, we, uh, and it's referred to as the first half of the tribulation period is referred to J as Jacob's troubles. It is judgment upon the dispensation of law. Now, we're going to have final, ultimate judgment here in about three hundred, uh, three and a half years, where everything is uh, completely settled, and we have the beginning of a new dispensation. That would be the millennial kingdom. But God is now going to specifically deal with the Gentiles. Now, in dealing with the Gentiles, by the way, because again, it's like we know where Israel is at, and everybody's blaming Israel for all of their troubles, and they want to destroy Israel. So why doesn't the world just get together and go after Israel? Well, because God's going to give them a few things to keep them distracted. So they're not going to worry about Israel for a while. So we have the angel casting fire upon the earth in chapter 8, verses 3 through 5. And another angel came and stood over the altar, having a golden censer and much incense was given to him in order that he should give for the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar the ones before the throne and the smoke of the incense went up with the prayers of the saints out from the hand of the angel before before the god and the angel having taken the censer and filled it out from the fire from the altar and he cast it onto the earth and thunders and sounds and lightnings came to be and an earthquake and those kind of are um, different in the way that it's describing them so we're going to have this, uh, again, this massive uh, destruction that's coming upon the earth and really shaking it up. Six of the seven trumpets are now going to be sounded. The seventh trumpet, as we uh, follow through, the seventh trumpet will actually happen at the end of the millennial kingdom. It's not going to happen during the tribulation period. Uh, and there's a good reason for that, because the seventh trumpet actually ends the wrath of God. So we can't have the seventh trumpet actually sounding at the end of the tribulation period, and then yet God's wrath being manifested at the end of the millennial kingdom. You've got to understand how this is actually playing out. So there is actually going to be a pause between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. And we'll see that in Scripture. And when we were going through that, we did look at it in detail. So the first six trumpets take up uh, take us through the second half of the tribulation period. The seventh trumpet, like I said, happens at the end of the millennial kingdom. 
one third of the earth is destroyed by hail and fire. So this again would be a focus primarily on the unbelievers, Revelation chapter 8 and verse 7. And the first sounded and hail and fire came to be mingled in blood and was cast unto the earth and the third of the earth was consumed and a third of the trees were consumed and all the green grass was consumed. So like I said, it's going to suddenly get very intense for the Gentiles. They're not going to be concerned about Israel at this point. They're going to be concerned about surviving for themselves. So it's going to get very intense. One third of the sea, that is the Mediterranean, is then turned to blood. Now this, of course, is likened to blood in the way that it's describing it here. Uh, Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 through 9, and the second angel sounded, and as a great mountain burning with fire, it was cast into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures in the sea died, and the ones having a soul, and a third of uh, ships were destroyed. Now, it is actually specifically referring to the region around Rome, Israel. It's not the entire sea over the entire world, and how do I know that? because it says the sea. It doesn't say seas in general. It says the sea. It's talking about a very specific sea. One-thirds of the waters are then turned to uh, poison. They're, they're very poisonous at this point. And that would be in Revelation chapter 8, verses 10 through 11, which would be the third angel. And the third angel sounds, and a great star fell out from the out from heaven, burning as a lamp, and it fell upon the third of the rivers and upon the springs of the waters. So these are going to become, of course, described as uh, wormwood, which is a poisonous bitterness to them. And a lot of people are going to die because they're drinking this water that, that is very bitter and poisonous as a result of, of this uh, trumpet. One third of the sun, the moon, and the stars are then struck. So we're moving timeline pretty quickly through. Again, this is all going to happen within three and a half years. And as we get closer to the coming of Christ, things are going to get worse and worse. And they get worse and worse because the, the humans, even though the people here on earth, even though they know God is doing this, they, from the very, from the, um, Second half, or excuse me, from mid-tribulation, where are they hiding? Why do they hide when all this happens? Because they're hiding from the wrath of the Lamb. They know it's God. But what do they refuse to do? They refuse to repent. They're not going to change their mind. So things are going to get worse. Revelation chapter 8, and verse 12, And the fourth angel sounded in the third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars was struck in order that a third of them should be darkened and a third of the day should not shine and likewise the night. And of course, looking at that in, in context here, uh, in this strike, the earth is going to be caused to uh, spin a little bit faster so that it reduces the time that it takes to really rotate around the sun because the sun's going to start to become a whole lot more intense in its heat. As a matter of fact, it, it describes the sun, and ultimately it will, it describes the sun in a state of about two supernova. You know, so it's going to become very intense in its heat also. And, but we're going to, uh, in order to really preserve the earth at this point, the people on the earth, God is going to start spinning the earth a little faster. That'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mean, it's going to be very obvious to people here that it's spinning faster. You know, um, could you imagine all of a sudden, it's not just, you know, hey, the sun sets really quick all of a sudden, and you suddenly realize the sun rises a whole lot faster than it should be too. You know, now, I doubt this is going to be instantaneous. It's going to be something where the, the earth begins to speed up. You know, because obviously if you just suddenly sped it up immediately, everybody would fly off of it, you know. So we're going to start seeing the speeding up of the earth. At this point, we have three woes that are sounded. And I discerned and heard one of an eagle while flying in the midst of the heavens, saying with a great voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants upon the earth 
out from the remaining sounds of the trumpets of the three angels about to sound. And he's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Three woes are going to be sounded here. This word eagle, we kind of like to actually use the word eagle because we, we think of them as um, majestic beings. But technically, this word also means vulture. And, and actually, an eagle is a type of a vulture. You know, they just look a whole lot nicer than other vultures. You know, so in the way that it's describing, I think it's using an eagle in this sense because there's going to be a lot of death that's coming. Again, and there's already been a lot. At this point, Satan is given the key to the pit of the abyss. Now, this is in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I discerned a fall, a fallen unto the earth star. Uh, important actually to note here as we went through this, this particular, um, <coughs> excuse me, some of our translations kind of make it sound like the star is falling at that point. But actually, the way the original expresses is this is a star that has already fallen. And we know that the stars are a reference, especially from Job, the stars are a reference to spirit beings. And of course, Revelation describes that too, because it describes the, uh, the dragon when he falls. What does he take with him? A third of the stars. And we know that that refers to the angels that he's actually taking with him. So we have this fallen star. That would actually be Lucifer because he was actually cast down to earth. That is, he's not permitted to leave this globe anymore. Right now, he's permitted to go into the third heaven. And he's the one who's constantly accusing us before the Father. Constantly. You know, I think he just absolutely loves to do that. Go find something that the saint is doing wrong and go accuse him before the Father so he can get punished. Satan can't touch you. So he, needs, he, wants to say, he wants God to actually do it. Although it never works out the way Satan wants, you know, because God will child train us, but he won't allow us to be condemned to the world system, with the world system. Oh, so uh, the, when he did this, uh, I discerned a fallen unto the earth star out from the heaven, and it was given to him the key of the pit of the abyss. Um, the star, like I said, is in a state of having been fallen, and he is going to release his demons upon the earth. Now, it doesn't specifically state this, but you can now begin to understand what happens at mid-tribulation when Satan is cast down and his angels are also cast with him. His angels are all locked up. So the demons are now at this point all locked up in the abyss. Satan alone is here on earth. And now Satan does not need all of his angels in order to manage things. He is a very intelligent being. They no doubt help a lot. But at this point, they're taken away. That is for this first part where he's claiming himself to be God and he's setting things up. He doesn't have the uh, angel or the demons with him at this point they're all actually locked up they have to be locked up in order to be released where do the ones released come from they have to be ones who are locked up yeah some of these may be um some of the demons that were involved in perverting the seed but that's a small amount the seed of uh, well really it was all of the seeds of all created beings here on earth they tried to not wasn't just humans it was the flesh of all kinds that they tried to pervert and they were locked up for it but again that's a very small amount where we have quite a number of them coming out the way it describes them revelation chapter 9 verse 2 and he opened the pit of the abyss and up came smoke out from the pit of the abyss of a fire of a furnace burning and the sun and the air were darkened out from the smoke from the pit and out from the smoke came locusts unto the earth and authority was given to them as the scorpions of the earth have authority 
So you can see that there that there's so many coming out. It's describing it as though the uh, here the the sun is being like smoke is being covered. Now remember the pit is within the abyss and is a place where Satan will be bound for a thousand years. He's actually bound to its side. So he's going to open up this pit. The, he's given this key, Isaiah chapter fourteen verse fifteen. And chapter 36, verse 16 talks about this. The abyss is a place in Hades where uh, some of the fallen spirit beings that refuse to keep their first estate are currently being held. And now, like I said, those are the ones who tried to pervert the seed of humans to really um, get around what God said in the garden when he said to the, well, at first he said to the snake, you're going to crawl on your belly. But then he said to the one behind the snake, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. Well, they tried to do, pervert that. They tried it before and they tried it after. That's where we get our Nephilim and our Rephaim from. Nephilim is a term that means ones who are mutants. Those were before the flood. Rephaim is a description of those after, and that describes fallen ones. Well, they made an attempt. Many of these angels were the ones, like I said, that attempted to do that. Jude chapter 6 and Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4 talk about that. Some of the angels, um, well, actually, as I go on, the others are those who were cast out of heaven with Satan at mid-tribulation. So this would be allowing his demons to come back up. There's going to be a problem, though. They're not really coming back up on his side. Because they're instructed that they're not allowed to harm anybody who has the seal of God. Now today, what do they primarily go after? They go after Christians. Now they cannot touch us, but they can influence us. And if they can get us to do something, that's going to cause some problems for us. Why would they not go after unbelievers? They already have control over unbelievers. They have more control under the uh, over unbelievers than unbelievers realize they're being controlled. So they are not permitted to harm those who they're not, they're only permitted to harm those who do not have the seal of God. And this is in verse four. And it was said to them, in order that they should not do unrighteous harm to the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree except of the existing humans not having the seal of God upon their forehead. So, you know, it describes them as likened to locusts, but they're not locusts that are coming to eat all of the green grass and everything else. These are, just, these are ones who are coming to harm humans. They are allowed to torment for five months. And this is in Revelation chapter 9, verse 5. This five months is a time, a period just before the end of the tribulation period. And it was given to them in order that they should not kill them. So even though they're tormenting humans, they're not permitted to kill them. But in order that they should torment them five months, and this torment as a torment of a scorpion when it should strike a human, which, you know, of course... We have plenty of descriptions, and, and some people actually know what it's like. It's extremely painful, but in many cases, it does not cause death. Of course, it depends on the type of scorpion, but this one is clearly one who's not causing death. But it's going to be very painful when they do actually strike. Um, they afflict, the afflicting of pain is uh, interesting how it's not just restricted to physical pain but it can also be emotional pain in the way that it's described. So it can also affect the mind, which of course pain does, intense pain very much impacts your mind. Matthew chapter eight, verse six, and second Peter chapter two and verse eight also describe this afflicting of pain and showing that it's not just a physical thing that's happening, it's also a mental thing. Timing of this indicates it is five months before the return of Christ to set up his kingdom. So we're getting right near the end of the tribulation period at this point. During this time, death cannot be found. This is really a very scary concept when you, when you we understand it. 
death is going to flee. People are going to seek death. And death is going to be no, not interested. Um, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 6. And in those days, humans will seek death and they will not find it. And they will strongly desire to die and death will flee from them. This is going to be a period in time where, you know, I've kind of described this when we were going through this. You know, um, it's it's not as predominant today, but, you know, we have gone through a period of zombies being a, of this major, well, everybody's all, well, everything's all about zombies and zombie attacks and other stuff like that, you know. And you're actually going to see some people, they're not dead, though, but they are going to seek and if a, if a person strongly desires to die, what are they going to do? They're going to tend to try to commit suicide, but in committing suicide, they're not going to die. They're not going to be permitted to die. You know. Now, again, these are the people who chose this. It's kind of funny how we're like, well, how can God be so cruel? God has given them plenty of opportunities to actually repent, and they have chosen no. And they're going to reap the results of their decisions. The four angels in the Euphrates River are now released. So the, the Euphrates River hasn't been dried up yet, but it's about to be dried up because it's got to make way for the kings of the uh, east that are going to come up for the Battle of Armageddon. Revelation chapter 9, verses 13 through 14. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice, one out from the four horns on the golden altar before God saying to the sixth angel, or the sixth angel, the one having the trumpet, release the four bound angels upon the river of the great Euphrates. So as of right now, there are four angels that are bound. Now they're angels, so they're spirit beings. We cannot detect a spirit being. We don't have that ability. Uh, and they're obviously bound with something that would bind spirit so that they cannot leave that area. They are being bound there for a specific time. God did this, and, and likely these are very high-ranking demons. Because mm -hmm. remember, even though the, the angels fell, they still held their rank, and we still have that today as it describes the world system with the rulers and the principalities and the authorities. There's different levels, and these are likely very high-level demons at this point as a matter of fact the way it describes their army that they come together is a lot different than the army coming out of the pit because the army that is described as they gather together um, their what they're wearing is very wealthy it's a description of one who is very wealthy so the angels are uh, released to gather the armies uh, to the great battle of the lord they will deceive the kings of the earth to go into battle, and they are going to use signs and other things where obviously the kings are going to have false prophets around them, and they're going to deceive them into coming to a battle. One third of the humans on the earth will be killed by the armies that they bring in. Now, this is not the killing of the armies, the, the one third. They are going to kill one third of the of the the remaining people on the earth as they move ultimately towards the battle of armageddon it is going to be a massive destruction now as we um we're going through this and we'll kind of brush back over this again kind of an, an overview remember at this point we actually have three major wars going on we got a war in jerusalem we got the king of the south coming up trying to destroy root jerusalem we got the king of the north coming over to defend him. And then we got the kings of, of the east coming up and, and where we get the Battle of Armageddon and all of that's going on. It's going to be a massive destruction. Revelation chapter 9 and verse 15. And he released the four angels, the ones prepared unto an hour, even day, even month, even year, in order that they should kill a third of the humans. So that brings us really into the end here where we have the sixth being sounded, but not yet the seventh at this point. 
because now we're going to shift and scripture, well, the book of Revelation is going to, we have a couple of areas where we're going to kind of shift in our timing to look at and get more detail about some stuff that's going on. So you remember the book of Revelation, although predominantly chronological, there's some areas within it that kind of shift and take us either forward or back, depending on what it's describing. So we're going to get a little bit more detail with those, um, like the rise of the, or more details about the man of lawlessness, more details about um, the harlot and other stuff like that. So God willing, next week we'll continue on in kind of a quick overview of the book.